thanks for having me. I feel like I wrote the wrong term paper, so bear with me here. Uh, <laughs> So, as Jeff said, uh, my name is Kristen Thompson. I'm uh, exec Education Director for the Future of Music Coalition. I'm also a musician and an entrepreneur. And I'm going to go a bit off script tonight. Most of the time with Future Music, I spend doing um, research, education, and policy work for musicians. I'm going to talk about the big picture, what I think the future of music is, not the performance of it, but the listening of it. As Jeff said, I was in a band and put out records throughout the 1990s. Most of the, we put, stopped putting out records in 98, but the back catalog lives on. And if you're like me, you've accumulated a lot of music in your lifetime. I have lots of CDs and records and mixtapes, a trunk full of seven inches. But I love music, but carting it around from one group house to loft space to apartment for the past 20 years has been tiring. So when we moved into our current house near Jeff, um, I never unpacked any of it. Um, it's all in boxes, neatly alphabetized in the basement. It's not like I stopped listening to music. What do you think I did with it? Do you think I digitized my entire collection? No, I don't have enough time or hard drive space to do that. Do you think I went on peer-to-peer -peer networks to recreate it? No, those don't pay creators, so I don't use them. Did I just rebuy it all? No, I'll admit I repurchased a few um, albums on iTunes and eMusic because it was easier than going through the alphabetized boxes but that's hardly an affordable solution. So instead, the primary answer is that I simply pay for access to music now. I have a subscription to Rhapsody, an online streaming service that lets me access about 20 million tracks for $12.99 a month. Um, so if I can think of an artist or an album, I can type it in the search bar, and it's tough. <laughs> I'm listening to it in a matter of seconds. Either the whole album or specific tracks, I can also make playlists, listen to related artists, plug in 10 band names, and it'll build a radio station for me. But that's not the only way we can access music now. There's countless webcasts to choose from, streams from terrestrial stations like KEXP or WXPN, online-only stations like Counterstream Radio that does new American music. And through all of this, performers, songwriters, labels, and publishers are all earn performance royalties when their songs are streamed. Then there's new services we all, a lot of us use, Pandora, Last.fm. Pandora builds streaming radio stations based on your music preferences. Last.fm has uh, social networking and song ranking components, and both of these also pay performance royalties. So you might find it weird for somebody who spent 10 years manufacturing and selling records to say this, but I think music lovers have to stop thinking ownership is the only way to guarantee you'll have the ability to enjoy music in the future. I'm not saying that you should, shouldn't enjoy collecting music. There's still plenty of cool things out there to purchase and beautifully packaged sets that are a pleasure to own. I'm just saying that you need to have, you, the need to have physical inventory of everything you ever wanted to listen to is now unnecessary. These new business models aren't without criticism. First, some people, including Steve Jobs, say these services are equivalent of renting music since we're a culture that places a high value on ownership and its associated rights, this terminology tends to resonate with people in a negative way. But think of the other things we rent, basically. Netflix, cable TV, access to the internet. These are all ways that we pay for access to content instead of having outright ownership of it. Why not music? The second thing is, I'll lose my music if I stop paying my bill. True, but if you stop paying your Comcast bill, you won't have access to cable TVs anymore, cable channels. So not paying your bill doesn't mean the TV shows disappear. It just means you can't see them. Just resubscribe and they're all there. <laughs> the third one, it's not portable. Subscription services and webcasting stations only work if I'm sitting at my computer. They're also usually incompatible with iPods. In an environment where consumers enjoy taking music on the go, this is a crucial point. Couple remedies. Both Net Rhapsody and Napster have wireless players you can fill up and take with you. They're not iPods, but if you're, when you resync your player with your home computer, it recognizes the songs you played while you're on the treadmill and compensates the musicians accordingly. Not even iPods do that. Number two, open up the iPhone and the iPod to competing platforms. Today's iPhones are designed only to work within the well-manicured music garden created by Apple and AT&T. That means no Napster, no Rhapsody, no Pandora. Um, but these, these um, problems will com with compatibility will fade as more devices are developed and we get closer with sort of Wi-Fi coverage around the country. So the value of actual ownership 
of content will continue to fade. There are already many ways music, music fans can tap into well-organized, well-curated music services that also compensate musicians when their music is played. I see a future where the value of access to music overtakes the value of ownership. Embrace the future of music on demand.